preferably I would have done half of my talk on the slides and then go to the blackboard. But but then this stays in front of it. Is am I right? Or so I, I was asking this, and he said somehow that would be this difficult. But. I understand, but then okay. Well, anyway, there's still no. I I want to, I will start on the slides actually. I mean, this is even fine because the, if you stop here, actually, I can already erase whatever is here. Yeah. <laughs> I will start on the slides. So just to start, I wanted to welcome everybody. And uh, the um, last night at the restaurant, I wanted to say a, say a couple of words. But unfortunately, the layout was not uh, conducive to that. But anyway, I wanted to thank all of you guys for coming and being part of this. It's been a great meeting and promise to continue exactly in that same vein. I wanted to just also say thanks. Your amazing community you work with in all my professional career. We have our differences, but we maintain our friendships and our uh, support of each other. And apropos of that, um, I wanted to uh, recognize a couple of major events in our, in our community. First and foremost, just to congratulate the postdocs at Saclay and Anthony Hoopner for getting the next job and so forth. But, but and then particularly Pierre, who has just accepted a junior faculty position at Ohio State University. And then Raghu, who we couldn't um, induce to come to USC, but he's moving on to a faculty position in Bangalore. And then David has adiabatically moved himself from a Royal Society Fellowship into a, slowly but eventually into a permanent position in Southampton. So this is sort of part of our tribe and I want to just congratulate them. But last but not least, our own Ibu Bar as well, who is, last week was told he had tenure at Johns Hopkins University. So I think, can we congratulate them? To the chairman. Okay, we're very happy to have Eric Wodlinde who will tell us about an operator algebra approach to black hole evaporation. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and actually also well to see many friends and have discussions like yesterday. Um, and I, I notice, of course, I mean, there's a, a bit of a difference between while well, thinking about the first world program and, and other developments that are going on in the field, which are more related to quantum information theory, et cetera. And I think it's important to have a little bit of a discussion of whether these ideas are related and how, how they might influence each other. So I'm going to present some work um, that I'm doing now with a, a PhD student of mine who's almost ready to graduate, Jeremy van der Heyden, uh, an excellent uh, student, actually. And I think, uh, well, you should, he's going to be on the market in, in, the, in the fall, and I think you should consider him. Uh, so the, the work actually is in progress, um, and I have not a full set of slides, and that's partly because I thought I could finish them after the dinner, but then after the dinner I, have, I decided first going to bed might be a better thing. So this is going to be partly slides and partly on the blackboard. And I also want to present it in a way of a discussion, because, um, well, the obvious things that I'm going to be saying that go a little bit against the, the ideas of the first ball program. So we'll probably have some things to um, argue about maybe at some moment. So what I'm going to start indeed is just showing you some slides, which are not exactly about the topic, but they introduce some concepts that I'm going to be using while, um, while presenting the, the main argument. And that I will do on the blackboard in the second half. So. Now, to the talk, I mean, the, the whole question about black holes and the information paradox, that's 
I think one of the main reasons why we're interested in it. And of course, the quantum properties of black holes. Well, we have questions like, well, do black holes have uh, smooth horizons? Um, I mean, if you think about the black hole as an object that looks like a, um, well, a quantum mechanical set of states that, that can make transitions and they emit particles, then you don't talk about the interior geometry. Uh, somehow the geometry is something that we associate with, well, the, what the, the Schwarzschild solution looks like. And then you have some, some smooth picture of what the horizon is. First of all, it's more like sort of indeed look, trying to look for the microstates. So I would sort of put the first world program in, in the left picture where you think about it as an object with many degrees of freedom, many states that can make transitions where particles are being emitted. Um, so then, indeed, the question comes, so what, what does the, the interior of the black hole actually represent? And indeed, is there something like a smooth horizon, yes or no? And even you can ask the question, what really happens when you fall into a black hole? Is the description that we get from general relativity? And, and I will be talking actually not, not about the uh, supersymmetric ones or, or I mean, basically just the generic black holes uh, like Schwarzschild. Then there is some standard way we think about how a person falls in. He crosses the horizon, eventually hits the singularity. So what is, is that really the right description? The other question, which is crucial in, in the whole information paradox, is that somehow some non-locality seems to be required in how information comes out. But what are the essential processes that, that, that allow us to retrieve uh, something like, for instance, a diary that goes into the uh, black hole and then then eventually come out and in this quantum information theory approach uh, there are many things that sort of play central role like quantum entanglement scrambling or even this notion of quantum chaos um, do they play a role I mean I'm also asking this for for the whole first ball idea one of the crucial ingredients in thinking about these questions and, and particularly also with quantum chaos is that there's large back reaction effects due to things like shock waves and so on, this might also affect anything that, uh, well, you would be doing with, uh, with another sort of geometric approach. Now, in the recent years, or a little longer actually, um, actually I have to admit, even I was already thinking about this, though the project I'm talking about is, is for going on for quite some time. And then came these papers by, by Ed Witten, uh, Pennington, Chandra Serikan, and, and collaborators uh, who uh, pointed out that, well, following actually work by Liu and, and Leuthauser, that there is a nice way to formulate this in a language which was developed by mathematicians for Neumann algebras. And you may wonder why, uh, well, do we need this kind of math? Actually, it turns out that there is, they, this approach gives a quite, quite nice perspective and actually I think many ingredients that the mathematicians have worked out for these algebras are quite relevant for answering uh, these questions. So what I eventually going to argue indeed is that when you have a black hole that has been radiating long enough um, that it will build up uh, entanglement with its uh, radiation, that there is a, first of all, a process by which we can recover information. That's basically what Hayden and Presco uh, pointed out but also that there is some way in which uh, that would lead to kind of a smooth horizon. And by the way, it's a conflict between information recovery and a smooth horizon, but it's basically at the heart of um, the information paradox. So here are some general facts about black holes, which I think everyone now kind of agrees upon. On. This is from, well, paper by at Hoft already in 84, he was already making these kind of plots, uh, drawings, where he said, well, if you think about the, the, the particles, the energy states in, in, in nature, uh, you have sort of particle states at low energies, then eventually you hit some threshold where you start making black holes, and then you have almost this continuum or, or a very dense set of energy eigenvalues uh, where you, you basically have a very high density of states. And we should think about each of those black holes basically as quantum states, uh, just like we think about particles as quantum states. So this was his way of thinking about black holes. And it's very similar to, I think, what we now know from ADS-CFT, where we indeed exactly have a spectrum of, of this sort. 
But what I want to point out here is that the density of these energy eigenstates is very, very high. I mean, you really have to understand, well, if you want to know every microstate, you have to have a resolve it resolve these energy eigenvalues in a very high position and things like the temperature and so on are then associated to well the, the the changes in the density of states when you make transitions for instance between energy eigenstates normally i have to say is that that when you emit a particle you make a transition of a certain frequency omega which is of the typical size of the inverse uh, of, of the temperature that would be a transition that goes between very large distances in terms of, well, the eigenvalues. You So there's, it's not easy to make transitions between neighboring uh, and energy eigenstates, but because that involves frequencies that are enormously small. So I think of this spectrum as an important indication of some special properties that black hole have that not every object has, like, for instance, whatever uh, burning coal. And also, I, by the way, uh, this is not a question about dynamics. I mean, there is already uh, also, of course, other interactions that you can add. And then the dynamics could be very chaotic because this is indeed uh, a typical spectrum for a quantum chaotic uh, system. The other thing that we know is that there is indeed sort of the standard way we describe quantum fields in um, in the neighborhood of black holes. And so one of the questions of whether there is an other side of the horizon is whether we can indeed have operators that describe, well, the algebra of states on one side and that they have kind of what you might call mirror operators on the other side. And where and these could relations I ask a question are about, Could I ask a question about your previous slide? Yes. So when you said that this energy spectrum is very chaotic and special to the black hole, if I were to ask in what way is it different from the spectrum of uh, atoms in this room, like which also look chaotic to me, how would I quantify that difference? We'll come to that. I mean, there is uh, okay. one, one important aspect of this is this is random matrix statistics. So we're going to be using things like ergodicity, scrambling, and random matrix, matrix statistics. And also the operators, if you have an operator that acts on this, it does not act on, uh, well, it, it acts in, in a way where it involves many of these states. And this is where you find that there is something special going on. Because generally, when you make transitions in atomic systems, you see certain spectral lines or things like that. This is clearly not the case here because every frequency kind of uh, occurs here. So if I look at differences here, and this is also why it's easy to kind of fall in. If you want to make a transition between two eigenstates, with a certain fixed energy difference, you will find those energy eigenstates where this the transition can be made. And then the, the, the likelihood of being absorbed in there is, is, well, one. That's kind of the thing that's special of these properties, of these black holes. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, we see uh, th that there are actually identities that relate the operators uh, that act, for instance, on the vacuum state uh, when we act from the left and from the, well, on, on the right side. And we can do the same on the, on the left side. Usually you exchange then the operator with sort of the, the conjugate of it, its mirror. By the way, this kind of state, uh, actually, I'm going to, be arguing that when we look at uh, these operator algebras, this is not always possible because this is a state we can write down in a theory where you assume that the Hilbert space factorizes in the Hilbert space on the left and on the right, which turns out not to be uh, possible in, in certain algebras like uh, when we have quantum field theory, the vacuum uh, should not be assumed to have this kind of uh, form. This is another picture which is kind of related uh, because uh, here you assume indeed there's some analytic uh, behavior and actually this is also the way that we sort of derived these, these, these Boltzmann factors. We use sort of analytic properties of the fields by analytically continuing from left to right. And this can also be seen in, in, the, in the Euclidean approach where you indeed have a, a way of where you analytically continue so this would be like the Euclidean part that you might say ends at the horizon, but 
both sides of the horizons are present because when you look at this uh, spatial section, that is the, the t equals zero slice also in the Euclidean section. And then the analytic continuation brings you to the other side. So having certain analytic properties allows you also to extend something that you have on the right left hand side to the to the right hand side or the other way around. Um, by the way, this state then that you obtain can be thought of then indeed as sort of a, a purification uh, of the, the thermal state. Um, yeah, this comment is not so important. What I, I actually hear po pointing out is that there's two ways uh, of thinking about these Boltzmann factors. One is indeed due to this analytic continuation that you do. The other interpretation is in terms of the spectrum where you say it's some ratio of two um, um, what is called uh, spectral densities. Uh, so if you take the, the density of states uh, and, and take this ratio, you get a Boltzmann factor. And that's a very different way. This is sort of a statistical interpretation of this Boltzmann factor. While here it actually came from some analytic properties. Anyway, th this recent work actually gives a, a new perspective on this, which kind of brings it closer to interpreting things more in, in a statistical way. So let me now come to this Hayden Preskill uh, recovery question. So this is something that involves indeed entanglement. So if you think uh, about a black hole that has been radiating a long time, and you might want to think about this indeed sort of more as your fuzzball uh, object that has uh, all its quantum states. And of course it makes transitions and then the particles are being emitted. Eventually they are collected in some reservoir and this I can think about really as just whatever, some quantum system that we all know about, but we put it in some quantum computer where we can analyze very closely what's going on. Then uh, what Hayden and Preskill pointed out is that if you wait long enough, first of all, that the black hole becomes maximally entangled with the radiation, then anything that you throw into a black hole after a certain amount of time, which is called the scrambling time, you can well, wait for a little bit more radiation to come out, this Hawking particles, then there is a algorithm that you can apply, a decoding algorithm that basically undoing the scrambling that acts then only on the part in your reservoir. And so at that moment, you can get the information out. So here all the interactions, by the way, are local in a way, because you might say, well, you throw in the, the, the diary, um, you, you let the black hole do its dynamics. This emission process is just, well, if you think about this as, as a kind of a first ball, that, that emission is not a very spectacular thing. It's namely a transition that sort of happens here, which you can interpret locally. Then also the decoding can be done locally in, in the system of this, uh, reservoir with all the gas inside and so but then the magic is that whatever i have thrown in here somehow uh, appears on that side this has been made more uh, geometric by the way so one of the things that is, is kind of missing in this picture is how does this connect really to the space time um, the other thing that i will be using uh, is that uh, this idea has led also to the EPR's ER proposal, namely that there's some way of doing the decoding where you um, throw in, where you imagine throwing all the radiation into a black hole. I mean, because I, I, this is also energy and matter and so on, you can try to form a black hole out of it. And the idea is that if you do this very carefully, that because of the entanglement in here, you create some uh, bridge between them. And then the process of decoding the, the diary is actually the same as what would happen if you throw it sort of the diary into the black hole and recover it from the other side uh, of, the, of the throat. And so there's some way that this entanglement might actually help you to smooth out the horizon and actually indeed recover what the, the diary is doing on the other side. And this is the, the thing I want to argue that that happens and that is supported by these uh, insights that now are appearing from uh, operator algebras. Go ahead. I 
been shown from what assumption and so what's missing from to solve the information paradox because this sounds like okay information comes out and we can decode it but i don't know so there is been okay so the, the the tension that i think is the information paradox is not that information can come out because i mean once you accept that we can treat a black hole as kind of a quantum mechanical system that has states and so on what's the magic now the magic what then becomes do black holes also have an interior because the actual information paradox is is a, a a clash between the idea that there's a smooth horizon where you just can fall in and there sits the diary inside and how can it ever come out that's the information paradox so the information paradox is not answering the question that the information can come out no it's resolved if we also know the experience of an infalling observer and i claim that the way you see that there's a smooth horizon where you can fall into the black hole is by the same mechanism by which you recover the radiation the information so i say that actually what i i just actually said it here there's some way i can do the decoding there and i get the diary out here what i'm claiming that if you, what you actually are doing and actually that's the most efficient way of doing it is is to really just throw this radiation into the black hole by which you actually have created the interior of the black hole and wait on the other side and then what the what happens to the diary it simply falls in crosses the horizon and is on the other side so i think the smoothness of the horizon and information recovery are actually the same thing and then i think we have resolved the information paradox because then we have both a smooth horizon and interior and we know what that information can come out and there won't be any cloning because this diary is indeed the same diary so the th diary that falls through the black hole is also the diary that's being recovered and Or there is a sequence of computations that I have to do to recover, and what That's is the what complexity? Is yeah. yeah, yeah. What is the complexity of, of such a computation? What is the time scale, and what does it take to actually do that? This is first of all a matter of principle, but I'm gonna do it in the way that I said. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna let the black hole do it for you, and then the question becomes a different one. So. Let me say it this way. So there is, in principle, a way of the, uh, reco recovering it. That's kind of, that's been shown here. I'm not going to talk about the practice. But from a physical perspective, the, the, the practice is, is, is meaningful. If in principle there are computations that can be done, I, I don't think that, but that, in practice cannot be done. I don't think that, that that was the content of the black hole information paradox. It was not the actual decoding whether it can be done in any finite time because even when i burn a paper it's going to be very hard for you to recover what i wrote on it well, but we don't say that, that we have a paradox there but in practice that you can set up a, uh, an algorithm to do it in in finite time right which may oh not no but be, i think that's here is also which, finite this is uh, i mean it, it's very long but it's still finite Maybe um, I, I, I could just make one yes. comment to that. Yeah, I think I would state the information puzzle differently. The puzzle starts one step before that people couldn't figure out why you wouldn't have the picture of the black hole where everything goes in. So to show that you can actually break the no hair theorems and actually get the information out, like in the piece of coal, that is the main step in the information puzzle. And if at the end of that you find you don't get a smooth interior, that's fine because you at least got the information out. Well, the okay. Thing, the I, I thing agree I would, that, that yeah. if we would, if that would be the conclusion, I'm, I'm, and this is actually, I'm actually repeating many things that had Hoft said three decades ago. I mean, he had this notion of black hole complementarity where he basically said 
there's just two complementary views on the same physics. One in which you wait in the radiation where things come out, but there's also the reality of an about the following statement and and maybe i'm going to indeed use this picture to indicate this so the diary is something i would be throwing in from here and then it normally it would enter in this region now the thing that happens in the meantime is that there's also radiation being emitted because the statement was that i can recover the diary when um, well, i wait long enough so that it's being scrambled but also I collect some more radiation. So what that means is that actually means that this, uh, the ion of the sitting has been shifted in such a way that the actual diary has entered in this part of the region, because this is then the region where you can reconstruct uh, what's, what's coming, coming out. And, and I'm gonna indeed argue that this is the correct way to think about it, but I'm gonna, well, on the next slide, I will talk about it again, the hayden Prescott protocol, but I'm gonna actually map that also onto this picture. And this picture actually suggests something smooth because you really have to think about this as a smooth space time, but it's made out of sort of gluing together the, 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 the parts, the operators that describe the black hole together with a set of operators that are acting on the radiation. So in operator language, these are two sort of commuting operator algebras that together kind of form the entire geometry. Um, yeah, this is indeed sort of the, the, the protocol that we actually, this is actually from a paper that Herman and I, well, we wrote a draft, we never published, but where we indeed sort of make clear that this state that you get, which is looking like a thermal field double because it's like having a CFT with a copy of it, can indeed be reconstructed by a kind of recovery process. I'm not going to go through this in detail, by the way, but I'm just showing you that, that there is some way of making a state out of the radiation. So this is degrees of freedom that came from the radiation and, um, and states from the, the CFT in such a way that you kind of construct the thermal field double. I'll, I'll, I'll refer to this on the slides uh, on the blackboard later. This is actually a precise implementation of the Hayden Prescott protocol. Um, I'll, well, maybe this is sufficient to explain it. Actually, it comes from a paper from Kitaev and Yoshida, who said that there is a, a, the, the following algorithm. Um, you, you think about this sort of as a quantum uh, circuit. So this is the state that we made from the black hole where we made the maximally entangled state with the radiation. So this you can think about as a family of bell pairs. Then um, what happens is that you throw in the diary and then you let a unitary work uh, during a, a certain amount of scrambling time. Then you wait for the radiation to come out now, uh, this line represents whatever is left of the, the black hole. Um, then um, what you do with the radiation part is basically apply the inverse operator. So if this is an operator U, you would here operate with U star. Um, and that also produces a similar state as this one here by, by doing the following. Namely, you take a reference EPR pair which you sort of have in your bag, 
and, and you put one of the legs into the same leg that the diary goes in. And then you keep the other one. And then you do a kind of measurement, but actually one way to think about this is also as a search for a certain state. Namely, if you have some EPR correlation, eventually you put a, a projector here, which sort of on, on the correct EPR pair, you actually indeed then have performed what would be a teleportation protocol where you, the, the diary comes out here. So think about this picture and I will actually draw it later on the blackboard because this is going to indeed be the way that also it ha happens in space time. That's it. That's my slides and now I'm going to go to the blackboard. Um, so let me now um, put this in the context of uh, kind of more the first ball picture. Um, yeah, I'll... Well, actually, this paper has two uh, versions of this protocol. Uh, what you... This, this projection is something that would indeed have a probabilistic outcome because you want to be having a particular EPR pair there, namely the one that's sort of like the identity. But there's another way of implementing it, which is unitary, which is called a search algorithm. You can namely do a search algorithm that actually finds that state for you. So it does not involve an actual projection. So there is a unitary way of implementing this protocol. Um, so let's think about uh, oh, the middle three boards. Ah, that's the middle three boards. Okay, now I understand. So let's think about our uh, black hole. And at first, going to not assume anything existing in the interior. I'm going to assume that there is maybe some some fuzzy thing around the, the horizon. And that could be whatever what the first ball looks like. Or maybe other physics. I mean, people introduce stretch horizons and so on. It's also the region where sort of maybe this quantum chaos uh, appears. Um, so the diary is something I can throw in here. And then I wait for radiation to come out there. Um, so I think about this as being associated to a state. Um, yeah, let me write that somewhere. I want to make this picture bigger. So I'll write the states here. So when we think about the microstate, then let me denote that microstate as chi i. And this is part of some Hilbert space. Then uh, when I wait long enough, there will be radiation coming out. So I eventually also build up uh, a, a system that is describing the radiation. And I end up with a entangled state. Um, so I, I, the actual state I'm working with will be some state psi that is uh, entangled. Um, and here I'm going to indeed make some assumptions about uh, generic um, randomness. So I'm going to write down some coefficients. So I have the state chi i, and then the radiation has some states eta, alpha. And I'm going to th think about these ran this as random sized coefficients. Now, uh, one way of sort of rewriting this is by introducing um, sort of mirror states, chi tilde, which are simply defined by taking this expression and leaving out the, 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 the chi. Because then uh, if I assume actually that these coefficients satisfy random matrix statistics, this have an average size, these states indeed become approximately uh, orthogonal. Because a priori, they should, they're not these states eta, I assume, to be orthogonal, but this is not necessarily orthogonal. 
Uh, I'm going to normalize this in a way where I also then assume um, indeed that there are some dimensions of these Hilbert spaces. And, and if I normalize this with the correct uh, normalization, um, this is actually, uh, if I take this to be actually the dimension of the, this, this Hilbert space, then this is an approximately normalized state because I can then write this state as a maximally entangled state. I have to say this is an approximation, but it's not going to be very important. So how I'm going to use this, um, and maybe I'm going to already draw something on the, on the third board to go back into this picture. Um, one thing that maybe I'll, I'll add actually to this picture is that I um, take this mirror state and it's kind of a property of entanglement that when you have a system with a certain set of states and it's being maximally entangled or closely to maximally entangled with some other system, you obtain some kind of mirror image of your system in this way. I mean, there's a map that takes you from here to here simply by making use of the entanglement. So there is a mirror kind of picture of this one, which I'll indeed put here. So this was the first step actually of the decoding. Actually, Kitaev and Yoshida, they start from this assumption that I already have a state of this form. And this is what's denoted, uh, they denoted by this bell pair. So I'm gonna actually, well, let me draw it here. So I'm gonna actually draw this Kitaev Yoshida um, protocol here, just for you to look at. So um, the protocol was like this. There's a diary coming in. Let me draw the diary. So this is indeed the diary that's sort of going here. For my diary, is something like where I have written some lines and it goes in. And here's radiation coming out. And there's some unitary process that, that, that happens here. That unitary process is this unitary matrix. And the, the black hole that being entangled with the radiation, actually that entanglement is present here. So there's a time flow that I'm gonna be thinking about, which is the time flow that is gonna do the scrambling. It's gonna be this time flow. So initially I'm at this state and I'm gonna think about the radiation state as being described here. Then uh, I'm gonna draw in here the entangled state that I've written down here as an entangled bell pair. So this is my black hole. And there are many of them, so I'm drawing some more lines. So this is uh, the black hole part. And, th and this is kind of the, the mirror black hole, but, but it actually was something that was part of the radiation. But it's sort of the states that I've written down here. Now, uh, the protocol tells me to put now here. So there's one special thing about... Um, <laughs> maximally entangled states is that if I would not have this line and I would not draw anything here, this unitary will be sort of the inverse of this one. I can sort of push it through this thing in and they would annihilate each other. But now uh, the protocol actually makes use of the fact that I can add some other input lines. So this U is not acting on the same all of these states. This one is taken out, so this is where I put in this other reference one. And the final state is gonna be the black hole, which is kind of a little smaller after the radiation. And also the radiation part that's being entangled now with the, with the black holes actually gonna be a bit smaller, but the thing that I've done namely is I've taken the additional radiation that comes out. So those are the objects that come here. Um, and I entangled them actually 
with the analog lag here. So you should think about this picture being reflected here so that the external lags are indeed sort of the same and you sort of pair them this way. So this was the protocol and then the conclusion was that the diary came out here. So let me now uh, also add these objects in, in the picture here. So this is the, the, the radiation in, in this other system. And the system has to be read like this. So the, the unitary that went up here is the unitary that's acting here, that's you. But the other unitary goes down there. So the, the final state is, is what actually is, is represented here. And that has these two radiation parts. So actually, you think about this radiation as sort of propagating along the horizon in this one too. So this is indeed sort of the Hawking partner of this one when you would actually be allowed to sort of draw it here. But that would be assuming indeed that it sort of continues in this way. And so the projection that I've done here is actually looking for making sure that there's a vacuum state, namely that these objects are being tangled with each other. And then what happens is that there's some way that the diary can enter here. Now, as I said, the picture looks a little funny because how can the diary enter here? Because you normally would say that the diary should enter there. And this is actually because this projection is not sort of an innocent thing. It's actually a thing that produces a shift. It's a shift that indeed shifts this thing up. And then the diary simply enters in here. So this is what I've done now is all in type one language because this is just quantum mechanics and the algebras I was talking about are finite algebras. Now what is happening now in this recent developments is that people are taking certain limits where we think about, for instance, the limit here where D goes to infinity. Here we take a limit where, where G goes to zero so that the amount of entanglement or even the, the, the entropy of the black hole actually becomes infinitely large. Uh, those then are suddenly, uh, well, we are entering in, in a different language, but the, the protocol which I wrote down here actually still applies because one of the things that actually also Itai and Yoshida mentioned is that this whole protocol does not depend on how large these systems are. I can also take here formally the limit where this number of bell pairs actually goes to infinity. This is something that indeed will affect what kind of operators I can consider uh, that act on, on, on my, my uh, Hilbert space. Now, hopefully you start seeing the picture already appearing that, that what I'm gonna argue now is that, that the, the fact that this diary eventually is gonna cross the horizon is just a statement indeed that this is gonna happen here and that we have a, a kind of smooth horizon eventually appearing where we can indeed connect the whole, whole diagram by indeed taking, taking these limits uh, in the appropriate way. Um, uh, questions Eric, about this. Yeah. Is, is there a way to formulate the statement of a correlation function yeah. of some in-state, like the diary, and then the out-state of the radiation? Is there a way to think of this algorithm as doing that, as computing a correlation function for you? What do you mean by correlation function? I mean, Some um, cor correlation function where you throw the diary, there the unitary that pushes you up to the radiation and then back to the path radiation and then look at, yeah. So, they, uh, so this is related to things like uh, out of time ordered That's correlators. Right. So there are shockwave effects it, happening. What is and the precise so formulation? Of, in that? So the precise language that I should have used here is they claim that the protocol only works if the operators that act on this lag and on that lag have 
uh, out of time ordered correlators that that start vanishing because that's sort of where the um, uh, quantum chaos starts putting in. So quantum chaos, the chaotic properties and the fact that this radiation sort of has been colliding. So this is where the shockwave picture yes. becomes very important. Mm -hmm. These states, this basis of operators here and the basis of operator here are very different bases. So you should not think about this as a classical space-time picture. Maybe I should have drawn some lines here. It's clearly that this outstate Hilbert space and the one here looks very different. But but they but they're the unitary that maps one to the other. That's correct. So so the correlation picture should work. So the question is, can you construct? Can you note what those operators that you need to construct for this out of time correlation? So, the, so the, the point is that any operator that acts here and any, so that's part of this. So any operator that acts on this, these legs and, and operators that act on those legs, they should have um, these OTOC uh, vanishing. So there must be scrambling. This is actually the, the so this must be a scrambling operation, and that scrambling can be quantified in a way. And even the the fidelity or the, the, the likelihood of recovering the diary from there can be expressed in how much scrambling there is. So so there's a very quantitative way of, of doing this, and and those OTOX are, are, are correlation functions of that sort. So can I, can I ask? So far, we've been talking about. Uh, so, uh, sorry? Yeah. So far, we've been talking about sort of basis changes and entanglement of those um, and different bases. Yes. But I've got a nasty feeling I'm about to say a sleight of hand where there's an interaction Hamilton that's about to be introduced where the book crosses the horizon. And so there's going to be a. So far, I'm, I'm, I'm happy because. But there's no, a okay, so complete the interaction, the interaction yeah. which is, is responsible for this. Yeah is what, what I'm doing here. So it is something that involves radiation that has been emitted and being added to the radiation. So it's something that's being done in the radiation system. There's some way that, that this box of radiation is also sitting here, of course. Yeah, okay, so what I'm so looking for... So the projection for... that I'm doing there is actually the decoding that, that I happen to do in the radiation okay. part. But it's some projection that actually involves projection on both sides of these. Okay, these. so what I'm asking is, when you do that, is that involved taking, adding a Hilbert, oh, sorry, Hamilton, an interaction, a bilocal um, interaction that is over vast distances? That's the question I'm asking. I don't think so. Um, because I, I have to tell you that even uh, if I think about how something crosses a Rindler horizon in ADS space, so I can cut ADS space in two, I have a Rindler horizon. The Hamiltonian that's responsible for that is a Hamiltonian that acts on the boundary. And it's a local Hamiltonian. And so everything that, that, that happens, so the, the notion of locality is depending on where you are. There's no local thing. We're not talking about Hamiltonians that are acting in this picture. I mean, there's something that we're doing in the, in the radiation system that makes eventually the diary coming out. So the... Where are these two qubits that are being quote unquote annihilated against one another? They're sitting here on either side of the horizon. Well, because yeah, initially, so initially one's down in the lower right corner and the other one's in the upper left corner. That's correct. But this one, well, this, this one actually comes from here, of course. No, but you're right that, that indeed, this is where, where, where the, the, the crucial thing happens. The, um, but let me first of all make clear why they're close to, to each other, why there's no non local physics involved and that's namely because I'm, I'm actually have to wait until these objects are um, in the radiation so the radiation you're waiting for the radiation to come out which is kind of what's happening here and then i did to do this projection and i claim that this projection pro is the same it? as sort of making clear that that there is enough entanglement between these modes so that this looks like the horizon 
Well, yeah, that's maybe because of my drawing, but I think the. Well, uh, yeah. Yep. I don't. You can draw them wherever you want on the blackboard. One of them's very far away in the radiation, and the other one's still behind the horizon. Mm, no. No, but the horizon was the radiation. This was. If the I wait this, long this enough, they get arbitrarily uh, far apart. This was the, radi it's the radiation Hilbert space. I constructed this state from the radiation. So this is this this. I just draw this here. I just. Yeah. decide to draw this state there but but it is radiation so the fact that it comes here in the radiation is, is simply that I, I i can use this now and do something with this locally in the radiation so there's no non-local stuff happening yeah so this was the black hole. Which was the black hole, the left side? That is the radiation. So um, just for clarity. So just like here. I mean, yeah. here I had the black hole, and here I had the radiation. Yeah. So I, I just would like to be clear that, of course, when the Hawking particles go in and out, they're entangled. Are you basically saying that they're in an entangled state, and therefore the nature of the entanglement is measurement of this measurement, just same thing as EPR pairs? Or is this something different being said? They become EPR pairs, yes, but the... Uh, I, I'm really reacting to the comment where you say, but this, uh, this is in the radiation. So I'm trying to understand whether that's basically a statement of correlation or so, entanglement so, between the thing inside no, so, and thing outside of no. something else. The point is that this, this is what's the radiation before. And then I, if I have this in my algebra, I don't have the access to the, the diary. I have to wait until this becomes part of my algebra. Right, but the reason so, why... So then this is one system. But, but the reason why, uh, I'm just trying to get clear on this, the reason why when that becomes part of the algebra, you have access to something else is because of the entanglement and the correlations embedded in the extra quantum that comes out, right? It's, it's nothing other than Entanglement produces a relation between the two things. The entanglement, so I, there was entanglement here. Yeah. Then there was, well, I had a here pair. Yeah. But now what I've changed is the, so by, by doing this operation, I've, I have by hand sort of entangled these. But they were not entangled to begin with. So I think the question yeah, uh, and the uh, folks can but, correct me if I'm wrong in understanding the question, but I think their question is that how can you produce entanglement between two things that are very far away via a local operation, right? If it wasn't already embedded in the state to start with. No, I think but that's the question. they're not very far away. That's what I'm saying. Because the radiation... Emil, here. Emil? So I have to indeed wait until whatever the radiation comes out here. And if I want to do, so here's my quantum computer that, that has to do the decoding. The, and, and then the quantum computer just takes two of the bits that are in his computer and, and projects them and puts them in an EPR pair. That's but, a local operation in that computer. But the name of the game is you need to eventually engineer correlations, entanglement between the early photons and the late photons that are emitted by the black hole. And by the time you're collecting them out way away from the black hole, they're as far apart as you want. They're far apart by you know distances m cubed uh, for Schwarzschild black hole in 4D. Oh, you're asking so, so how, do how, I, can I, uh, how can I even find this object in, in a... Well, the, the, the thrust of the small corrections theorem is that at the moment they're created near the horizon, they're totally unentangled with one another. And now we're gonna wait for a lot of radiation to come out. And we need to have correlation between the early photons and the late photons. Oh, but they're not totally over... unentangled with each other because I started from a maximally entangled state and, and this one emits something. So according to even the, the, the firewall sort of idea is that this thing can never be, it is entangled with something in the radiation already to begin with, but it may not be this object. 
So here I, I've made a certain choice of what is being entangled with. Okay, but, okay, well, yeah. Yeah, can I just get a clarification on the relation to the original Hayden Preskill picture? So let me make a comment and you can tell me if it's accurate. So if I was doing Hayden Preskill originally, I would have assumed unitary evolution. Yes. And I would have drawn just the left hand half of your picture where the diary would have been thrown in. Yes. And the, the black hole would have been so either. And then, then the, the, the diary comes out. Well, the, the information content of the diary comes out via photons or gravitons That's or something right. else, not exactly the, the particle content, but the information content would come out in the radiation. So your system R would have been this top left of your diagram. This, this would have been R. The, the, I, this is my reservoir where I collect. Yeah, this. and so the black hole system would be some combination of either the future wedge, which you're not really using in this diagram, or the horizon between the left wedge and the future wedge. This would. I have to draw a line here where I distinguish between what I call radiation and black hole, of course. Right, and this would have been on the diagonal line between the left wedge and the future wedge. Right. No, th this actually line is, is where I, I start sort of to collect. So I imagine that I, I have a Hamiltonian here. That So if I do this in ADS-CFT, I can put a Hamiltonian on the boundary that kind of tries to extract the radiation from the system. And then I put it in some other system, and, and that other system I call the radiation. Bound. Sure, but I'm asking about the black hole. For Hayden Preskill, the black hole would be in the center, you know, the future... The diary falls in to something from the Here. bottom left. That's the black hole. No, the, the, the... Or if you like, the boundary of the left, the, the upper boundary of the left wedge would represent the black hole for Hayden Preskill. This you say? Yeah. Yeah, but that's, that's for, after that's... you wait long enough because when I do this scrambling, this thing falls in and, and enters this region. Yeah, so it falls in in a short time and then the radiation of, emerges from that over a long time scale. The, the, well, you need the scrambling time, so there yeah. is still a scrambling time needed, but then you, like a few quanta, uh -huh. and they have to, of course, travel outward, but then you have these quanta here, and then the protocol tells you that if you do this operation, then, then you have covered information content of the diary okay. there. Okay, thanks for the clarification, we can discuss more. But later. what I'm saying is that this calculation, I can map, I do, I'm doing that actually, I, I wrote down the state. The entangled state and i wrote it like this because i wanted to and then i made a picture of this state here and what i'm claiming is that the protocol is actually gluing these things together in such a way that indeed by this measurement i actually shift this up and that the diary falls through actually you get, do get the picture that pennington was uh, proposing <laughs> Yeah, actually, uh, I'm just going to indeed summarize a bit because what I, I, I'm doing currently is indeed going through these limits that eventually uh, for the D large and G to zero, that you can indeed talk about the algebra that's acting on uh, this. So what is special, uh, helpful from these for Neumann algebra is that there is certain limits you can take. This D to infinity actually makes an algebra with the one that uh, at Witten and collaborators talked about which type two algebras, but Hong Liu and um, Leuthauser, they pointed out that in this G to zero limit, which is like the C to infinity limit of a CFT, there's actually what's called a type three algebra. And so what a type three algebra looks like, it's very much like this picture, but it actually allows you to do the following. Um, it indeed, makes things analytic so the same analyticity that i talked about before uh, there's also um, these operations that are now described by you there's actually uh, something called the model of flow which is actually a combination of the two um, yeah maybe i should i'll use the middle board for that uh, and draw that here um, So let me see what I wrote down here.
Yeah, so what is a von Neumann algebra? It's actually a, an algebra of operators. And in the case of, uh, well, the operators that act, for instance, on the Hilbert space of black holes, uh, you would think about A as being the bounded operators on that Hilbert space. This would be sort of type one. I already mentioned that when I take the limit uh, D to infinity, there's also, well, actually the, the correct way to sort of define these algebras is by talking about projectors. And what is possible in type one is project on single states. So we have indeed a notion of a, a state and that it means that there's a, a projector, um, which is sort of the smallest projector. Those are not possible uh, in, in these other two kinds. And there's something called type two and type three. The model type two actually separates even in two types. Uh, one is uh, the one where there is a trace. Uh, well, actually the, the distinction between the two is that there's a definition of a trace in type two. Uh, and there's two kinds, namely where you have a trace well, of uh, the identity, which is finite, and then you call it type two one. If there's no trace of the identity, if the identity does not have a trace that's finite, then you call it type two infinity. Um, actually, uh, I think that the natural language is actually type two one, but I will briefly tell you what type three is like. Uh, because that indeed has these analytic properties as follows, that there is a state that you can introduce. Uh, and when you have an algebra, the algebra you should think about as acting only on one side. So the algebra A acts on part of the system. And that also means that there's no um, operator A in this algebra that annihilates the state omega. So every state uh, creates a new state. And the statement is even that if you take the collection of all these states, that this defines the total Hilbert space. Now the uh, operator that I talked about, which is this modular flow operator, can be defined in this case. And it's an operator that, um, well, I'm going to cut things a little short because of time, actually is exactly related to these time flow operators here. The formal definition is that there's a map from A to its conjugate. And then there is a operator delta. Well, I want to write down one last equation, namely that the um, um, this operator which is called the modular operator can be thought about as, as the generator. So K is actually the boost generator that, that generates uh, the flow precisely in this way. And this unitary that I wrote down here can actually be expressed quite nicely in here. Uh, but it turns out that uh, in these algebras, there's no independent definition of uh, boost on the left or on the right. So there's no independent um, action of this operator on, on either the, the system, say this would be the black hole system or the radiation system. It's an operator that acts on both. 
And if you write it out, what it would mean, if I raise it to a certain power, I actually can raise it to an imaginary power because then be, this becomes both basically like a, a time uh, flow generator. This actually um, can be identified then with this, actually the action of uh, both U and U star at the same, uh, same time. And uh, this time then you can think about as uh, say basically the scrambling time. Now, what is special about these type three algebras indeed is that this is a smooth, you can actually get almost from free uh, that there's a smooth geometry appearing here. Because the other thing you can show is not that there's not just uh, a time flow that acts like this. There are also operators that do shifts. And it's this shift actually that you can um, uh, associate also with the shift that's required actually to get this diary eventually in here. Now, what I am now doing in the paper with, with Jeremy is actually also showing that there's a similar story in the type two language that is in between what I described here and this picture. So I should maybe draw the picture like this is that there's actually a shift happening here in such a way that the diary indeed enters into this region. And the reason is, is that the radiation system has been extended by including uh, this part of the, the, uh, the radiation. And so in a certain way, indeed, this radiation made possible for this uh, to come out, but the mechanism by which it happens involves these, uh, the, this recovery protocol. All right, I see you standing there, probably means the time is up, so I will take questions. All right, okay, go ahead. The small correction theorem is that there cannot be uh, I think that's always based on the idea that, that the information is behind the horizon and that there's somehow that there's some way that we have to retrieve the information from something well, near the black hole to infinity. That picture here is, is not, that has already changed because of the fact that I'm claiming that the interior is describing is described by the radiation. So there is already some non-local physics happening in the following sense that I'm saying the interior, the fact that I put the, the, the radiation system here, you might say is some non-local way because I'm sort of using some part of that system to describe this system. But, but the, the, I'm claiming that this is not a contradiction of any sort because the thing that you should not try to do is think about this happening and that happening at the same time. What I'm saying is that this is the experience of someone falling in and the fact that it's being recovered is actually the fact that it could be recovered on that side as well. That sounds like you're solving a problem by fear. So the, 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 the map from here to here is the scrambling map. And that's kind of the, the, the idea. So the information is scrambled, but it's still there. Since we're short time, I guess we can continue this very interesting discussion before the conference. Good. So I wanted to first understand whether anything on the left was different from the original Hayden Prescott, which I would... So, yeah, I, so you have to remind me then what is the original Hayden Prescott? Uh, yeah. On this I would say 
we need some notion of a stretched horizon so from the start so that we don't even keep everything timeline. Yes, I'm sort of okay, drawing so that. You're, yeah. You're having that there, but it was so tight that it was hard to. Yeah. Okay. okay. So then, so then for me, uh, for Freddie Pressfield, that modeling the black hole by yeah. the unitary finite density, you know, all the things you said at the start, the, yeah. quantum system, quantum yeah. blocks, but they're agnostic about the jump, like also, right? Yeah. Like, so they're modeling all of this sort of interior or whatever's behind our head. Think of it as living on the stretch drive. For them, that's the black hole. Yeah, but I think I, I understand it until here because I can do in a Penrose diagram many things. Sure, but we want to allow for the diary to the outside. Here's your diary. Yes. And we want to let it fall in in a small proper time, but it still could be a long time as seen from the boundary. So, you know, as we draw our time slices of the boundary. Uh, Okay, so that's the, the diary comes in. Yeah. And then, as you said correctly, you know, all of this radiation is coming out. So, up here, you have your radiation system as you collect it. Yeah. All the way up here. Yeah. And then, so, how is that different from my picture? I mean, so it's the thing that was confusing to me was you had you, which is acting for me, you is acting. Here, when the diary falls in, then your you, I would have thought you were going to say, was acting from after it's fallen in. But this is, oops, this is where you is acting. No, the when falling you, is the you. Uh, well, you, it has to fall in first and then you act with you. No, it, your diary, your, your, it's here. Or in my picture, this is in the entire system. You're, you're exploding this so I'm putting that picture there. So this is what this line is. This line, and actually you can attach something to it. Okay, so th this is all happening.